A trilogy in the Sonic franchise is a rarity. While there is an abundance of duologies in the franchise, the number of trilogies is only about a third of that. The trilogies are worth looking into as they are some of the most popular series in the entire franchise and comparing them against each other is not only a fun challenge but also allows me to gain some new perspective on them and that's what I want to walk away with more than anything. The three trilogies are the OG Classic series, the Advanced series, and the Sonic Rider series. Since there are only 9 games to cover, I'll treat this as if I were reviewing any other game and give an in-depth look into each series rather than giving a summation of opinions like I did with the duology ranking video. Logically, we'll start with the story, visuals, music, and gameplay of the original trilogy. The original Sonic trilogy has a great story, one that is better than the sum of its parts. In Sonic 1, Sonic aims to stop Dr. Eggman, who has captured his friends and uses their energy to power his robots to help him find the Chaos Emeralds hidden away on South Island. Sonic collects the emeralds and defeats the Doctor. In Sonic 2, Sonic heads to Westside Island. There he meets a two-tailed fox boy named Miles Prower, or Tails because of his two tails. Tails is inspired by Sonic's effortless confidence and begins following him, hoping to gain some courage of his own and help the Blue Hedgehog stop Dr. Eggman, who was searching for the emeralds to power his death egg. Sonic destroys the death egg, causing it to land on Angel Island. There, Eggman encounters Knuckles, the last remaining Echidna and sole protector of the Master Emerald. Eggman convinces Knuckles that Sonic and Tails are after the Sacred Gem and the two form a team to stop them. A few days later, Tails tells Sonic of a massive energy reading his radar picked up and the two make their way to Angel Island to battle Dr. Eggman and the new face. The story ends with Sonic and Tails saving the day once again, gaining Knuckles' trust and returning the Master Emerald back to its rightful place. As I said before, the trilogy story is incredible. Each story connects to the previous arc and leaves room for expansion in the next iteration before wrapping up everything nicely in an action-packed finale that makes you sit back and feel good as the credits roll. The story isn't this complex, multifaceted, interlaced conflict with 3 million moving parts that all connect in some ways and wraps up well by the end. The story does deal with topics such as eco-terrorism, nature versus machine, and maybe even imperialism if you want to dig deeper, but the way these themes are presented in the story are very easy to pick up and understand, especially if you look at the way the levels are laid out. Sonic 1 and Sonic 3 do this well. In Sonic 1, Sonic starts in the lush hills and mountainous region of Green Hill, then navigates through the ruins of Marble Zone to get to the Spring Yard on the outskirts of an unnamed city. Near the outskirts of the city, Sonic finds the Labyrinth Zone, a place full of imagery that keys you into a deeper story of South Island's past. Sonic makes his way through the dangerous labyrinth and ends up in a construction area near the city in Starlight Zone. This construction area was built by Eggman and his robots and leads to the evil doctor's hellscape, the Scrap Brain Zone, where Sonic defeats Eggman and restores peace to South Island. The level progression matches the story thematically, and it also makes sense geographically as well. Sonic 3 uses level transitions after every zone that explains how Sonic and Tails get to different areas of the island. So while you could say that it's random that Sonic jumps off flying battery and happens to land in Sandopolis, it also makes sense because they could have landed anywhere including Sandopolis as it's near the lava reef zone that holds the hidden palace at its core, and Eggman was headed in that direction looking to revive the death egg and steal the master emerald under Knuckles' nose. Sonic 2 doesn't commit to this level progression fully, as it immediately goes from the lush landscapes of the Emerald Hills to the chemical plant and then aquatic ruins to Casino Night. It does well with level progression matching the themes of the story from Hilltop Zone onward, but to me, something like Emerald Hill to Aquatic to Mystic Cave, Hilltop, then Casino, Chemical Plant, Oil Ocean, and then the rest of the game would have made more sense. Someone might point out the transition from Marble Garden to Casino Night Zone in Sonic 3 as a weird progression, but at least there are mountains that you can see in the background that shows that the level is a city within the mountains between Marble Garden and Ice Cap. Regardless of the level structure, the original Sonic trilogy is one of the best looking sets of games ever. Sonic 1 at the time was praised for how great it looked, and the team made it a point to make the next two games look even better. In my opinion, I like the aesthetics of Sonic 1 more than Sonic 2. Sonic 2 is graphically better, but nothing in it matches Green Light and Starlight Zone's whole vibe for me. Sonic 3 is the best looking of the three games. The sprites are more detailed, the more expressive, level designs and backgrounds are dense and the effort to include more cutscenes adds to the game's overall presentation. Even the backgrounds help the storytelling. They do well with showcasing Angel Island as this land of diverse biomes. 
I think this contrasts well with Sonic 1 and 2 that feature landscapes that blend in well with each other if you take out the mechanical theme levels. Sonic 3 aims to show that there's something more with Angel Island than what we may see throughout the game. I have an entire theory video breaking this down, so go give that a watch. The music of the first two Sonic games was composed by Masato Nakamura of popular Japanese pop band Dreams Come True, somewhere inspired by songs the band had made previously such as Green Hill and the ending of Sonic 2 based off their well-known song Street Dreams. The songs of Sonic 1 and 2 are much more poppy in their sound. Nothing in these games is as heavy as Sonic 3's music. The music in Sonic 1, for example, is on the softer side. It's much more melodic. Sonic 2's music uses more bass, which is Nakamura's instrument of choice. Sonic 3's style is just completely different. It's always been a bit of a mystery as to who exactly developed what tracks for Sonic 3 and Knuckles, but we do know that people like Jun Suno and Brad Buxer worked on this soundtrack. Suno's preference for heavy rock music can be heard in music like the Death Egg Zone's music, some of the Act 2 music of zones like Angel Island, Santopolis, and Doomsday Zone. Brad Buxer likely composed songs like Launch Bass and more obviously Ice Cap which takes direct inspiration from an unreleased song from a band Brad was once a part of. The music from Sonic 3's ending apparently is what inspired Michael Jackson's song Stranger in Moscow, as Brad Buxer was part of Michael Jackson's team of composers who worked on Sonic 3 at the time. The music in Sonic 3 mostly does away with the pop sound and dives more into hip hop and rock. This leads to a generally heavier sound, and I think it's great. When getting the footage for this game, I got lost in the music as I played. You can feel the power struggle between the heroes and villains in this battle for Angel Island through the music, especially in later levels like Sky Sanctuary and Death Egg. The soundtrack is so fire that even some of the original beta music sounds great if we go back and give them a listen. The gameplay is the same between all three games. Sonic 1 doesn't have the spin dash, so players have to rely on momentum to roll into a ball to get past certain obstacles or experience the selling point of the game, speed. Well. It's speed about 50% of the time. Sonic 1 is the traditional platformer of the trilogy. Promises of an exhilarating adventure are halted by stages like Marble and Labyrinth Zone. The rest of the time though, it's a better mix of both elements. Sonic 2 refines the speed by giving you instant access with the inclusion of the spin dash. This makes it easier to travel up slopes and allows for level design to have more transitions between top and bottom paths. Sonic 3 takes what Sonic 2 did and simply applies it to more characters. Tails and Knuckles have the same moveset as Sonic. All three can do the spin dash and pressing the jump button in midair allows you to use the insta shield to Sonic, fly his tails, or glide with Knuckles. Since Sonic doesn't have those other abilities, the trade-off is that he can use the effects of the elemental shields while the other two can't. Knuckles completely owns this game. The ability to climb up walls leads to an unprecedented amount of exploration to his levels. Knuckles and Tails have access to different routes that otherwise might be impossible to get to with Sonic alone. Because of this, levels in Sonic 3 are quite large, offering a myriad of chances to take different pathways and find goodies and special stage rings to collect the Chaos Emeralds, which differs from Sonic 1 and 2, where you need at least 50 rings by the end of the stage or before hitting a checkpoint respectively. I can't even begin to describe how much I love the immense size of Sonic 3 stages. The stage maps can be found on Sonic Retro. I used to sink hours into this game as a kid and coming back to it all these years later just reaffirms how great this game is to me. In combination, the classic Sonic trilogy is strong. This is the shit that formed my fandom at such a young age. The multiple playable characters, the music, the visuals, the story are all there and it's well done, which is the best thing about all three games. It's not super simple, it's effective, it's intentional, but not unnecessarily complex. The classic trilogy is exactly what it needed to be, and what it is, is one of the best series of platforming games of all time. Individually, they may have their problems, but unified, it's one giant masterpiece. The Sonic Advance trilogy story isn't really connected between games. The first game is a typical Sonic vs Eggman story. Advance 2 is more of the same, but this time involves the debuting mother and daughter duo of Vanilla and Cream the Rabbit respectively. Eggman kidnaps Vanilla for reasons that aren't explained, but Sonic saves her, giving us some of the most iconic scenes such as his supersonic transformation sequence and the scene where he saves Vanilla. Sonic Advance 3 story is a little more involved. Eggman uses the emeralds to split the world into different zones, and it's up to Sonic and his friends to restore it. Eggman creates his own version of Emerald from Sonic Battle, naming it G-Merald. At the end of the game, 
Cream asks Tails to restore the super fighting robot and it now serves as the protector of Cream's family. I don't really have an opinion on the story of these games, they're just there. The visuals are a definite upgrade from the classic trilogy. Despite this, I think the Genesis games look better. The backgrounds in the advanced games feel basic in comparison to the original series. Advanced 3 does a better job with this than the first two advanced games. The sprite work across all three games is great. I understand why so many fans made so many OCs and videos using these sprites. They're expressive, and each character has unique animations that perfectly capture who they are. From this standpoint, I love the advanced trilogy and the music is also great as well. I don't find myself going back and listening to the advanced stuff as much as I did in my early teen years, but I might have to change that. Leaf Forest, Music Plant, Ice Paradise, and the beta version of Leaf Forest music from Advanced 2 are all incredible. Nothing from Advanced 1 sticks out to me, but it's a solid soundtrack. My absolute favorite pieces of music from this series are Cybertrack Act 1, Sunset Hills music, Twinkle Snow, and the end credits music all from Sonic Advance 3. I can't say there's a single bad piece of music in the Advance trilogy. Music in Sonic will always deliver, and that's just a fact of life. Yeah! The wonderful music in this series was composed by an ensemble cast of great composers. Tatsuyuki Maeda, Kenichi Tokoi, Hideaki Kobayashi, Masaru Setsumaru, Fumi Kumatani, and Tomoyo Atani. The only person I'm sure I haven't mentioned in this lineup before is Maeda. You guys know how I feel about everyone else here based on my other reviews of Sonic Team adjacent games. Excellent composers making excellent music as usual. For all this praise I'm giving it, it's sadly uh, time to talk about this unfortunate fortunate gameplay. Look, I don't think it's all bad. First off, all three games play relatively the same with some differences that clearly define each installment. Advance 1 is closer to the classic games in that it's slower and has its moments of thrilling speed. The characters all have similar movesets to their adventure counterparts which I think is cool. Sadly, Sonic doesn't have a reliable homing attack and Tails can't do his cool breakdancing Tails attack. Aside from that, as I said, Advance 1 being a slower game still encourages speed but also doesn't. It's rewarding to find your way to the top path to find goodies and the spring that leads to the special stages. There are many times where I'm zooming across a stage and there's a spring that launches me backwards and fucks my entire flow. Spikes and enemies jump me from almost out of nowhere multiple times in this game. The screen crunch from the Game Boy Advance leads to the same problems I have with the Game Gear Sonic games constant leaps of faith only to suffer the consequences of putting my trust in the people who designed these levels. Advance 2 thankfully has less of this, but it ramps up from zone 5 onwards. Lots of bottomless pits, sections of speed that lead right to your death, this shit is everywhere in all three advanced games. Placing a ton of enemies and spikes everywhere isn't real difficulty, it's just annoying. Despite the level design, I did find myself enjoying the games whenever I didn't have to think much just holding forward and jumping at certain times to keep my speed up and reach the end as fast as I can. Advanced Stage's level design is a bit more complex than the first two. A good number of the stages are designed to loop around back to the beginning if you take certain paths, which I thought was interesting. I've never seen that kind of level design in Sonic games before, and Advanced Stage did a good job with it and I enjoyed some stages that implemented this, such as Sunset Hill Act 3 and Ocean Base Act 2. I had the most fun with Advanced 2 because the boosting gimmick felt good when I earned enough rings and kept the speed going, even at some later levels. Advance 3 has a tag team gimmick depending on who you put together from Sonic, Tails, Knuckles, Amy, and Cream. Each combo provides characters with different abilities, which isn't always a good thing. For example, Knuckles and Tails teaming up causes Tails to lose his flying ability from playing as him. I'm not a fan of that. The ability should have just been relegated to only being used when charging them up with the R button. Remember when I briefly mentioned special stages? Advance 1 handles it the best, hands down, no question. All you have to do is find a unique spring in each level to access the special stage. This goes back to how the game rewards the player for exploring the levels. Advance 2 and 3, however, has some of the worst handling special stages I've ever had the displeasure of experiencing in any Sonic game. Advance 2 actively encourages the player to blast through stages. You'll find that at some point you've collected these special looking yellow rings. These are what you need to access the special stage. There are 7 in each act of every zone. If you get them all with Sonic, you get to access the true final ending and an extra boss. Fairly standard stuff, right? Well. Good luck getting the 7 rings in each act. They don't save the ones you've already collected, so if you're not keeping track of where you've gotten each one, you're going to be wasting a lot of time. I recommend using Tails and Cream as they can fly and this allows for better exploration with the space to go fast when you're up for it. Also, me recommending Tails and Cream doesn't really mean anything. Sure, they allow for the closest feeling to a best of both worlds scenario, but if you're a completionist freak, you gotta get all 7 coins in each act 
across all seven zones with all four characters. What do you get for all this? Amy Rose, who was readily available from the start in Sonic Advance 1. Getting all seven with every character unlocks a mini Chow Garden and bosses in Time Attack if you give a shit. Advance 3 does the same thing, but this time instead of seven rings, it's ten Chow. The good thing they did here at least was save the ones you've already found as it's ten Chow per zone, not per act. Already, that's much better, and for Advance 3's flaws, you can make the effort to look for all of them as the game does feature more platforming than Advance 2, but still has Advance 2's boosting gimmick which makes levels awkward to play through. You also need a key to access the special stage which is located somewhere in every hub world. The special stages aren't that good in the Advance trilogy, I'm gonna be honest. Advance 2's special stages aren't that bad, they're the ones I preferred the most of all 3, but 1 and 3's special stages, they just suck. It's not that they're hard or anything, they just don't feel good to play in my opinion. I wish I could speak more positively about the gameplay for the Advanced Trilogy because otherwise, these games do literally everything else well. These games are full of charm and inspired the Sonic fandom very heavily in the 2000s and even now. People to this day are begging Sega to re-release these games on new hardware. I'm surprised to see that there aren't many Sonic Advance inspired fan games out there though. Projects like Sonic Advance Revamp should get more support. Sonic Advance inspired games in general should get more support, but that's a different topic for a different day. The Sonic Advance games are truly a unique set of games, for better and certainly for worse. This is why rating games is a challenge I don't envy any game reviewer taking on. The trilogy does so much right, but it also does so much wrong. The third and final trilogy to cover is the Riders trilogy. The story of the Riders trilogy, or at least the first two games, are centered around the tale of the Babylonians. Alien bird creatures who crash landed on Earth and were left stranded. They built a legacy as great thieves of their time, as well as ingenious inventors of what modern times and Sonic's world refer to as the Extreme Gear. The key to their city of the Babylon Gardens was entrusted to Jet the Huck, the leader of the current Babylon Rogues trio. Eggman wants this key to the garden and forms a partnership with the Rogues, who in turn mess with Sonic and his friends throughout the course of a Grand Prix to collect all seven emeralds. Once Babylon Garden is resurrected, all players in the Grand Prix head to the ancient city as Eggman double crosses the Babylonians to unearth the secret treasure. After Sonic finally defeats Jet, they then team up to kill Shugo Hei, the guardian of the ancient treasure before unlocking the magic carpet and both groups sharing their goodbyes before going their separate ways. In Zero Gravity, the arcs of the cosmos that powered the ancient Babylonian ship that crash landed to Earth are finally landing after orbiting Earth for thousands of years. The returning players all managed to gain their own arcs used to defy the laws of gravity and race to stop Eggman from using the arcs of the cosmos to control all the world's robots. One of the robots is gone haywire, taking all the arcs to the Babylon Gardens, destroying the city but revealing the ship the ancients arrived on Earth with. Sonic and the gang defeat the powered up robot, restoring the ship, but the Babylon rogues choose to stay on Earth, where they get to continue their thieving ways and Jet can race Sonic to his heart's content. Sonic Freerider showcases a bunch of the characters in a new Grand Prix tournament set up by King Doc. King Doc is revealed to be Eggman, who is collecting data on the races to create the fast extreme gear. That's it. Oh, and Metal Sonic takes the information for himself, and it's revealed that he is the blue egg robot teaming with Shadow and Rouge, but Sonic beats him and yeah, that's it. The story for Freeriders isn't really there. Enjoyment is more so found in all 12 characters interacting with each other. Team Rose is the funniest of all 4 teams easily. Amy's hyperactive nature leads to some funny moments between her and Vector. I wish we got more out of Shadow and Jet's very minimal interactions in this game. Two of Sonic's biggest rivals barely sharing the screen was a missed opportunity. The story is more of a character showcase, a glimpse into the daily life of Sonic and his many allies and I appreciate that. It's very low stakes and I had fun watching the story play out, even if the reason for Eggman's schemes was a little disappointing. Back to the story of the first two games, I think they're fantastic, packed with lore that ties in well with the existing world. The pacing of the stories is great, in contrast to Free Riders, the first two games are full of high stakes battle racing and it's fucking sick. Jet comes off as a much more motivated leader in these games and that's not to say that he isn't in Freeriders, but Jet in the first two games is a much more intense character. His relationship with Sonic, growing from the shit talking cocky young man that gets on Sonic's nerves, to one where the two have a mutual respect is really good. The final cutscene from Zero Gravity just perfectly captured what they are to each other now. Jet and Sonic are masters of the wind. 
two creatures that live for the sweet sensation of racing around at high speeds. Jet may have other motives like collecting all the world's treasure, but when it comes to racing, being the fastest creature alive, he does it for the love of the game and Sonic can see that, which is why he readily accepts the challenge Jet throws at him anytime he can. There are other things about the story I love. They expand on Knuckles' treasure hunting prowess by showcasing his ability to read ancient Babylonian texts. It makes Knuckles' story in Sonic Frontiers make even less sense as in that game, he expresses wanting to go on more adventures away from the Master Air Mold, but for the past 20 years, people have jokingly noted that he's done anything but protect the magical space rock. I hope they pivot or at least recontextualize that subplot for Knuckles going forward. I also love Eggman being a little shit in all three games. He's so gung-ho about all his plans and even when he technically wins, he still loses. He's hilarious without being the butt of every joke in the first two games. The first two games do well with establishing the Babylon Rogues as character in Sonic's world. I know that asking for a fourth Riders game sounds kinda crazy, but I'd be down for something akin to Freerider's story but told more seriously with a better overarching plot. It's a bit of a shame that Freerider's story makes no attempt to build on what came before it, but I also appreciate that it goes for something different because it's good. The visual style and art direction of the first two games are some of the most distinct styles ever across the Sonic franchise. Futuristic cities and mechanical settings blend well and serve as a nice bit of environmental storytelling relating to the Babylonians being genius inventors. I go back and forth about if I like the way Zero Gravity looks. Sometimes I think this game looks incredible, and other times I think it looks like shit. The extreme gear don't look as good as they do in Riders 1, and in general, the game has this washed out, sort of muddy look to it. It's not as vibrant as Riders 1 or even Free Riders. I don't think I'll ever have a consistent opinion on how this game looks. Even as I'm writing this now, I can't decide if I think Zero Gravity looks good or not. I have a weird love for this era of Sonic's model. From 06 to Riders to Zero Gravity, Long Sonic is a style choice that I've always wanted to see come back in some form. Everything about this model is ridiculously large, from his clothes, to his hands, and that goes for pretty much every other character. The Free Riders models are closer to what the characters have looked like since 2008, and I know for many that's a problem as Sonic has always been the series that changed up its art style and direction, but honestly, I like that the characters don't have super noticeable changes in their models that don't correlate with previous games. Sonic's model in SA1 versus SA2 is a crazy change. It's not bad, it's just an example of what I personally think is unnecessary change. I don't care about Sonic's model changing much between games. I just want them to have tons of detail and be expressive. The devs for the Riders trilogy did a great job making the model so expressive both in animation and in static poses. Free Riders has some excellent static model sprites during cutscenes. I was honestly blown away by how expressive a modern Sonic model was. It's crazy how it's been over a decade later and this is still an issue for the mainline games. Hopefully the bigger budget that Sonic Team got from Frontiers' overall success will lend itself to better use of Sonic's model and even some improvements to it. The music across all three games to the surprise of no one is really good. The main themes from every game are all great pieces of music, my favorite being the original version of Catch Me If You Can by Runblebee. The composers are the same from the Advanced Trilogy, but this time with Tomonori Sawada. With composers like Fumi and Hideaki at the helm, the soundtrack in both games is full of great techno music. The battle music from the first Riders game is probably my favorite track across all three games. In Zero Gravity, the music changes every time the gravity ability is used. Free Riders' music doesn't stand out as much. Sawada is joined by Koji Sakurai as a duo of composers this time around. Metropolis Speedway is the standout track from Free Riders aside from the main theme. The rest are good, but not great. In terms of gameplay, each game does something different. But I can't say that I appreciate all the gimmicks. Riders 1 lets the player manually do tricks in midair, and you can launch yourself further or higher by pointing a control stick forward or backward in time with your initial jump. Zero Gravity lets you do a different trick if you simply move the control stick in the direction when you launch off a ramp. You could pull off a perfect trick if you time your jump correctly, but also while not pointing the control stick in the same direction you did on a previous trick ramp before the current one, as the game keeps track of this for whatever reason. In Free Riders, if you jump and spin in midair, your character will do a cool trick. Don't know how the fuck to get that to work on the controller settings, but eh. I'm not sure why after Riders 1, they thought it would be a good idea to automate one of the coolest game mechanics from the first game. The tricky mechanic in Zero Gravity is interesting, but it's not as fun. It does feel rewarding to get it perfect, but it doesn't feel the same as pulling off a chain of tricks manually and getting that sweet X rank. 
Zero Gravity is also the only game that doesn't have a boost mechanic. Well, it kinda does, but what I mean is that in Riders 1 and Free Riders, you can give yourself a boost at any time you want if you have air in your air tank. Zero Gravity's boost mechanic comes in the form of the gravity boost. By doing the proper motion or button press, your character will activate the power of their gravity ring, allowing you to fly through the air and grind on specific objects to gain speed. You also need to use it in order to turn tough corners because the drifting mechanic from Riders 1 is also gone. Honestly, it's a cool gameplay feature. Too bad you can't really use it anytime you want. It's always used at specific points in the track. You can use it at random points, but like, why would you? It drains your GP quickly, and many courses have too many twists and turns for it to be used optimally unless you're cracked at this game, in which case, carry on. Zero Gravity is also the only game that introduces a gear change mechanic. It's basically the level up system that unlocks the things your extreme gear can do, such as grind, fly, or access power type shortcuts. Some gear allows you to change between any of these abilities at any time if you have the proper number of rings. This is a cool idea and it's implemented well. It allows for more route exploration with each track and encourages replaying them if you're into that. The first and third Riders games feature a more basic level up system. Another feature of Riders 1 that was taken out was the boosting, also giving characters their own attack abilities. Being near someone as you're boosting causes you to attack them. The brutality of the attack grows with every level up to 3. Free Riders doesn't have this, but as a power character you can punch things which I'm sure also means you could punch or shove other players, but I never attempted this. If you've noticed that I haven't mentioned Freeriders much, well, there isn't much to this game. It basically features stripped down versions of gameplay mechanics and gimmicks from the first two games while also making use of the motion controls of the Xbox Kinect. The only other gameplay mechanic worth mentioning is the Gear Augment System, which is a reworked version of the gear abilities in Zero Gravity, but you can only apply two to your gear before a race. And that's pretty much it for Free Riders. As a game, I think it's fun, but it's not as enjoyable as the other two were to play through. The Riders series is a fun trilogy. Like the other two trilogies, it's a fan favorite with the whole comp league and fan game made in celebration of the series. I'd like to see either remasters of these games or an entirely new fourth game be made one day. Hopefully sooner rather than later. I can actually say that for a lot of Sonic games, even some that I've talked about so far. A lot of Sonic games deserve more recognition from Sega and Sonic Team. Some of them unfortunately get lumped in with this dark era of Sonic and I think that's unfair. Going back and looking at these games over these two ranking videos made me realize that even in Sonic's worst times, we were still getting quality shit. People just didn't care to pay attention to the good stuff but I'm sure many other Sonic tubers have talked about that extensively. On to the rankings. I'll do two sets of rankings here. One where I rank each trilogy as a whole, and the other I'll rank the games individually. The classic Sonic trilogy gets the S rank. The advanced series is tougher to rank because there's a lot I like, but the games aren't great overall. I'll give them a B rank. I like them just enough to still get some enjoyment from each game. I like the advanced 3's level design the most. The Riders series gets the A rank. I know I flip flop on some aspects of Zero Gravity, but it's a good game. Free Riders doesn't offer much, but it's a solid game that I'm glad I finally got to experience. Now, as for what I think of all these games individually, let's see, uh, Sonic 1, A rank, Sonic 2, A rank, 3 and Knuckles, S rank, Advance 1, C rank, Advance 2, B rank, Advance 3, B rank, Sonic Riders 1, giving it the A rank, Sonic Riders Zero Gravity A rank, and Sonic Free Riders B rank. There you have it. Let me know what you think about any of these games and my rankings in the comments below. As I did with my duology video, I'll be leaving a link to a trilogy tier list ranking that you can edit yourself. While you're still here, check out that Sonic duology video. Shout out to you for watching, I'm out. See ya.